all right? All right, good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. It is Monday. We are, um, what's happening on my computer? Did it just close literally all of my windows? I think it maybe did. Give me just a second, everyone. I just pressed the update office and I didn't realize what I was doing. I was making a mistake, that's what I was doing. Uh, that's okay. Where's Mr. James? I don't know. Kids are out there doing doing something. They're living their lives, you know? Whatever you have a kid, the goal is to get them out there and have them live their lives, whatever that means. We don't need them relying on me. If they rely on me, well, then they'll never get anything done. It's important to rely on yourself. <laughs> that said, show yourself out the kids. Today, I actually do need the coffee. We have an inner circle webinar starting at um, in 59 minutes. So we can't go too long today because I have to figure out what we're talking about. Actually, I already know what we're talking about. We're talking about how to combat a frequent four better. Not a common spot, but um, I've had this question asked a few times. Say I three bet a lot, as Jonathan will suggest. Sometimes people adjust and then they start four betting. What do we do about that? Well, we have an answer. There's a good answer for that. You can um, find that at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. We'll be going over that in 59 minutes. 58 minutes now. Can't do a web another webinar on how to play the small blind. Go back and watch the first one. That's the great thing about pokercoaching.com is you can just go back and watch all the past ones. All right, we have a question today that I get all the time. I feel like I maybe answered it already. Maybe I didn't though. And the question was, this gosh, Thomas is crying his head off. Um, the question was, how do you categorize players quickly and figure out what they're going to do quickly so that you can make the adjustments that Jonathan will suggest, like this is a loose and aggressive player, therefore we should do blank. Or this player three bets too much, therefore we should do blank, right? So when you get to the table, you go and you play live poker. Online, obviously, you'll have no reads. Maybe you'll have reads like what someone's avatar looks like, but that's kind of irrelevant. Um, when you play live, you'll have literally... Online, you'll have no reads on your opponents besides looking up your opponent's stats. And if you're playing seriously online, you should look up your opponent's stats. There are a few sites where you can do that. You can see if they're big winners, big losers, etc. If they're big losers, obviously they're going to play differently than big winners. Okay, so you show up in live poker. That's mostly where this, um, this section is going to apply. You're going to have some initial stereotypes. I know a lot of people hate stereotypes. They think they're evil. And... Um, you know, maybe they are. That said, you have a lot of information available to you very clearly when you show up at the live poker table. For example, you show up, say a guy is already there in his seat. He has his chips stacked in stacks of five. He has no backpack. He has a monster energy drink. This person is probably not very good at poker. We're just going to make that assumption. Why are we making this assumption? First off, he's not stacking his chips very well. Second off, he's doing something that's obviously unhealthy to his body right off at the start of the day. He's there early, he's ready to play, like this is an important event for him. All these things will lead you to thinking, this player's probably not very good at poker. Okay, what if um, someone shows up, you know, maybe 10 minutes late, strolls in casually, you see him talking to three of the best players in the room on his way in, he sits down, stacks his chips appropriately in one second, has no problem. That person's probably at least competent and probably actually good. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, that is very, that's going to be a good indicator that this person is already a very decent poker player. So you can look for things like that. Uh, a few things off the top of my head. Uh, who are they friends with, right? Um, I know there are actually a lot of very good recreational players who are friends with a lot of the best players in the world. I mean, I'm friends with all the, or a lot of the recreational players, and they're actually very good. Um, so I'm trying to think if this does not apply. Like if you're friends with all the good players and you're actually friends, not just, hey, what's up? And then you walk by, if you're like actually stopping and talking and things like that, then um, it's, it's a little bit different, right? Because I mean, I get a million people say hello to me, but that doesn't mean we're friends. I'll stop and talk to like literally 30 people in the room and some of them are recreational players, but they're usually good recreational players. So that's a pretty clear sign, right? Next, how do they dress? Um, do they look disheveled? Do they look like they 
Are they dressed comfortably, right? Like most of the time people aren't gonna show up with a business suit unless it's actually with a purpose. And um, I don't know. I mean, some good players wear business suits, right? Like Tony Dunst wears a business suit. Um, Shannon Shore used to wear a business suit. A lot of people do wear business suits, but at the same time, I think you'll see the vast majority of pros wear comfortable clothes. Um, I mean, I try to dress a little bit nicer recently. I'm wearing a button-up shirt, but it's comfortable button-up shirt. I don't think dress is actually that relevant. Um, how do they talk, right? Are they using proper terminology? Do they talk to their friends? They said, I made a set on 993. Well, everyone knows you can't make a set on 993, right? Because you have two cards on the board. There's two cards on the board. That's called trips. Or they may say that I raised preflop, the big blind called, he checked, and then I led into him. You can't lead here because you're the preflop raiser, right? You'll hear things like this. And if they're not using terminology right, very often they're, not, they're just not going to understand poker at a high level. Um, finally, the stacking chips thing is very relevant. Every good player stacks their chips almost the same. Not exactly the same, but almost the same. And if they stack them in stacks of five, they stack them in stacks of 10, if they stack them in stacks of twos, if they, you just see lots of things that usually lead you to think, okay, this player's probably recreation. Let's see, Sabu has lots of disagreements here. Do you think appearances are relevant? Well, first off, this is all we have to base our information off of, right? A few people are saying, well, pay attention to their bet sizes. We haven't played a hand yet. There, no hands have been played. Zero hands. What they do at the table matters. Um, again, right? How they stack their chips. That kind of thing matters. But this is when we have stone no reads. A rich person who stacks their chips would appear to be good at poker. That doesn't make sense, Sabio. Everyone gets the same amount of chips when they start at a poker table. Or if you're playing a cash game, you show up and a guy has a million dollars in front of him, yet they're stacked in stacks of five, the guy's probably just not very good. Unless you're playing limit. If you're playing limit, that's different. Because in Limit Hold'em, often you'll stack your chips in the bet amount, right? Like say you're playing 816, you'll have 16 stacks of chips or $16 worth, whatever it is. That way it's just easy for you to put the bet out. But that doesn't happen in No Limit Hold'em. Don't you think some people act dressed differently to give a misconception? Maybe. Am I playing the Big 50? Absolutely not. I have learned my lesson when it comes to playing those um, very, very big fielded World Series of Poker events. I don't enjoy it. That's what it amounts to. Didn't Jungle Man wear a tie? I mean, listen, I've worn a tie at the poker table a time or two. I've worn a business suit at the table a time or two. You want to look at the overall way they dress. That said, I mean, like, this is initial reads, right? These are stone initial reads. Should you play the Big 50? I have an article on JonathanLittlePoker.com. Something to the effect of why you should not play the Monster Stack Tournament. Maybe go read that. All right, I feel like you're always readjusting and trying to not go back on your old habits. Okay, well, yeah, do that. Let's see. You like getting to know the players at the table for future reference. Yeah, you should definitely get to know people. That's definitely a good thing to do. All right, so after initial stereotypes, you're going to be able to play some hands with these people. You're going to see how they play, right? So a few things that are worth mentioning is you're very rarely going to see hands at showdown, okay? Whenever you see hands at showdown... That's very, very relevant. If you see people raising under the gun with 9-7 offsuit, the player's bad, okay? Definitively bad. Now you just have to figure out how they are bad. What are they doing that is bad? Um, if you see them opening under the gun and betting the flop, betting the turn, checking behind on the river with aces on a dry board, probably a little bit nitty, right? It's a hand you can definitely go for three streets of value. Um, if you see people running bluffs and then they turn over their bluff and it's a ridiculous bluff, maybe the player bluffs a little bit too much. Um, some people say, well, he showed a ridiculous bluff, so he sh would never do that again. No, we don't know that, right? That's making an assumption. Maybe you wouldn't do it again. That doesn't mean they're not going to do it again. If you see them run a bluff with like, a straight flush draw that no, has no showdown value, say they raise 9-8 of spades from middle position, and it comes 10-7-3-4-king, and he goes bet, 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 that does not mean he's a, big, a habitual bluffer. That just means he knows how to play because he's playing a very standard hand in a standard way, right? No showdown value draw, bet the flop, definitely bet again on the turn, definitely bet again on the river. If he checks behind on that king river, it means he's probably a fish, right? Because you should essentially always bet that king river because it highly favors your range. So all of these things are relevant, right? And I think, look, a lot of people are trying to say, but look at this player. This player does something different. 
This good player stacks their chips in stacks of 10. This good player wears a business suit. Understand, we're giving stereotypes. There are exceptions to every rule, okay? Whenever you try to give generic rules, a lot of people try to disprove it by showing five examples out of the millions of poker players. I'm just trying to give you all good advice. Feel free to disagree, but in this instance, you're all wrong. <laughs> all right, what else? So you wanna see the frequency of hands people are raising aggressively preflop. You wanna see how often they are calling raises preflop, right? If they're just, if they're raising and re-raising a lot preflop, they're probably a little bit too aggressive preflop, right? If they, um, continuation bet the flop, 100%, especially on boards that should be bad for them, very good candidate to check raise or to float if you are in position. Um, what if they play really tight, then they raise and re-raise and it turns out they have aces? Well, that player probably just playing super face up and straightforward. So you want to look for things like that. So the question then becomes, once we have categorized what the players do incorrectly to some extent, or we just see them limping a lot, or we see them doing things that are slightly bad, what should we do if we know they make slightly poor decisions? Well, first things first, you have to know your default strategy when you show up, right? A lot of people think, I need to show up and play as close to game theory optimal as I can, and that would be very, very wrong. The only time that would be right, and maybe even then it's not right, is when you're playing a very high stakes tournament against literally the best players in the world, and for some reason, you don't know who these people already have no reads. That would be a big mistake to play straight GTO because there are player pool tendencies, right? A lot of people, let's say, and if I go show up and play a $3,500 buy-in World Poker Tour tournament at Borealia, or the one in Falls you next week. If I go and do that, and I show up and there are eight 40 year old players, I'm gonna assume every single one of them is a little bit too loose and a little bit too passive right off the bat. Especially on the turn in the river, they're gonna be way too passive. This is a player pool tendency, right? This is what people in these games do wrong. So if somehow I get check raised on the river on the first hand, I'm sitting there with like the 10th nuts, which is like a pretty good hand, I'm probably gonna fold. When probably wouldn't fold against a good player, but I'm gonna fold against a recreational player who meets these qualifications. And you can call this stereotypes, you can call this player pool tendencies, call it whatever you want, but um, it's relevant, right? That's something you expect the opponents to do incorrectly. <sighs> Falls used today, okay, well good. Zubjin says, you're playing it, good, good job, good luck. You might as well win. Do you think ABC poker is easy to exploit? What does ABC poker mean? One of the most relevant things I was ever told, one more, more like um, inspiration, not inspiration, what is it? Mind-changing, life-changing things I was ever told by Dave Benefield. He probably doesn't even remember it. He said, my ABC poker is probably very different than your ABC poker. And it was true. His ABC poker was very, very good and strong. My ABC poker was, quote unquote, kind of straightforward, right? Straightforward poker is easy to play against. Good poker is not easy to play against. How do you keep notes on people? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. How many orbits does it take? That's what I'm saying, right? A lot of people think, well, that's where we need to go, right? How, let me write this down. How How long do, how long before adjusting, right? So first things first, Bruce says, take notes by mentally memorizing. If that doesn't work for a lot of people, it doesn't work for me. I don't remember anything if I don't write it down. As you see, just wrote it down, right? My memory is flawed. It does not remember everything perfectly. Okay, so we show up. We have general player pool tendencies. We know this, right? So given we have player pool tendencies, we should be adjusting to take advantage of that. Now, sometimes it's going to be right. Sometimes it's going to be wrong. But more often than not, it's going to be right. This is like whenever you use generic live tells or generic bet timing tells online or bet sizing tells you're going to be wrong like 40% of the time or something like that. But if you're right, 60%, you're going to print money in the long run. A lot of people want to know definitively that whatever they are doing is right. And in poker and in life, you very often do not know what you are definitively doing is right. I mean, whenever I set the price of one of my products, for example, we don't know if the price is right. And it almost certainly it's wrong. The odds that the first thing you try or even the hundredth thing that you try is right is almost 
always inc- it's almost always wrong that that is you, that is the right play, unless it's a very very simple decision, right? Say someone shows up to the tournament, they stack their chips in stacks of five. I would bet very good money that player is not in the top one thousand poker players in the world. I bet I bet all of my net worth, right? Odds are I'm going to be right. Maybe they get me one in a thousand times or something, but that's a good example of a very clear stereotype, right? Let's see. Yeah, I don't make show. Well, so I, my my strategy when I show up, it is a default strategy, but it is um, not to not. It's, it's a very fluid strategy, right? I'm not going to sit there and think I'm going to play tight aggressive poker all day. That's not how it works. So I was mentioning how to stack chips. You struggle with stacking chips. You go for side by side stacks of twenty. We always envy the guy who creates some super looking pyramid and don't have envy for irrelevant reasons. Um, I discuss this in my book, Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. I discuss how to stack your chips so that you will never, ever make a mistake. It's very important. Don't try to make a giant tower that looks cool. Try to make a tower that is functional. Do you believe it's important to tilt some of your opponents? Eh, maybe. You got a player taking notes. What does that do to your image? I don't know. It means you are studious, probably care about your results. I don't think it necessarily means you're good or bad. All of my students take notes, and um, some of them are good and some of them are bad, right? Does mixing it up just a bit not make a person straightforward? What does mixing it up mean? Junior says, poker coaching is the single greatest website you come across to date. Well, good. Thank you. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. How do you stack your chips? Okay. Essentially, you have a stack of 20. Stack every denomination in front of you, highest to lowest, or lowest to highest, whichever one you want. I'm left-handed. I put my chips in with my left hand, lowest to highest, okay? On the left, I have the biggest chip. On the right, I have the smallest chip. They're all in a straight line across. As I get more of them, they get stacked on top. Those get stacked on top until I get a 42 stack of each, okay? 42 stack. If I get a 42 stack, then I break it apart into two 20 stacks and put two on top. You don't really want one or two on top or none on top, or you don't really want a stack of 20 and a stack of 14, because then you'll get your counts off randomly. If you do it enough, you'll see what I mean. So that's what I do, 42 stacks, then I break it apart. Your chips should be able to sit in 42 stacks, no problem. Don't knock them over, don't be fumbling around. And these are in between my hands, right? I'm sitting here, chips are here. Cards go in front of the chips. We look at the cards like that. We're good to go. Maybe sometimes you have to move a stack slightly to the right, slightly to the left to see your cards. It's not a big deal. It's easy to do. Then you just start making towers like that. If you get 88 chips, for example, you should have four stacks of 20, three in a little pyramid, probably one to the side, either side, whichever one makes logical sense, and then um, one on top. Or actually, if I had 40, what would I do? If I had 88 chips, I would do a three, three 20s, in a pyramid, a triangle, then um, 28 on top. That's how I would do that. Then um, say I didn't want to do that, I could do eight, and then I could put one to the left and then put like the, the next denomination, if I had like four of those, put those on top of that. I discuss this, like I said, in the live book. Um, the question about live demeanor. You're self-aware and realize people are gaining information through the body language and better or worse, is there anything you can recommend? Go there, show up, seem competent, seem relevant, unless you want to look like a bad player, right? It's certainly... Um, relevant for you to go and look like a bad player if you can if you can so sometimes you can sometimes you can't i like there's literally nothing i can do at this point to go make people think i'm a very bad player unless i go somewhere in the middle of the world and wear a hat and sunglasses and a hood and act funny right i think a lot of people read too much into this stuff really because like i said if i show up and i don't know you i'm probably going to assume a lot about you right off the bat the only people who get special treatment for the most part are younger players in high buy-in tournaments. So why is that? The reason that's the case is because younger players often have a difficult time getting a hold of $3,500 or $10,000 unless they have either a very good job, which a lot of young people don't do, or they're very good at poker, right? At least competent at poker. So in situations like this, say I show up and there's a 22-year-old playing a 10K, that player's probably pretty good. He just has to be. Either that or he's a trust fund kid, but you'll figure that out really fast, right? 
if you show up and that 22 year old kid doesn't know how to put his chips in the pot and is using wrong terminology, all right, he's probably a fish. Um, but for the most part, they're at least going to be pretty good. Now, they may be tight aggressive, they may be loose aggressive, but they're going to be pretty good, right? Um, older players, they often have a good job, right? If you're playing a $10,000 buy-in tournament, either you satellite it in or you probably have a good job. And if you have a good job, that means you're probably don't, you don't have to be good at poker to get in the tournament. A lot of people get offended whenever I say something like, older players are typically worse than younger players. They just are. Why are they worse? Because the older players have had way more time in life to grind up money, right? Whereas young people have not had that time. So there is um, this age bracket that usually ignores all these rules, but it's interesting, right? Because they're starting to become a little bit older. People who are roughly my age, we fell into poker at exactly the right time. If you were between 16 and 24 at um, 2003, 2003, I happen to be right at 18, perfect age, right? If you were between 16 and 24 then, that is right around when the poker boom happened. A lot of people dropped their lives, or they were young to the point that they didn't have a life. I didn't have a life, right? I was just a kid going to college. And they devoted their lives to poker for, well, until now, right? And if you devote your life to poker, you're gonna be very good. So people who are now my age, roughly 30, 30, I don't know, 38 to 30, people who are in that age bracket, can be very good. Now it's gonna be fun in about 20 years when I'm 50 something, then there are gonna be a lot of 50 year old guys who are gonna be really, really good at poker. And you might ask, well, why are there not younger people now who are doing the same thing? The answer is because the money is way harder to get a hold of. It's very, it's way more difficult to win at small stakes today than it was when I started, because everybody's better, right? So very few people actually rise to the top today. And I'm sure I'll say, but look at blank and blank and blank. Look at every 20 year old who's still coming out especially out of Europe or you know, non-American places. And yeah, there are always exceptions, again. But if you look at all of the good players from my era, they're all still around, they've all survived, they're all thriving, if they decide to stick with it. And why is that? Because we had a humongous head start, right? I had a head start, and by the time I was 21, I had 350K to my name. And uh, you can lose for a long time off 350K. If you turn 21 and you have 50K to your name, well, now it's way harder to succeed long-term because... If you go broke, you go broke and you're done. So a few things stop the players now from succeeding. The fact that they start playing initially, they just get crushed, right? If you're a fish and you start playing today, you're gonna get crushed. And if you start, um, if you started back whenever I was bad, if you were bad, you would just kind of break even or lose the rake. So obviously more people are gonna have more good experiences back in the day. Um, and the fact that you have to grind hard the whole way up. I mean, like whenever I was playing, 2-4 No Limit was the softest game in the world. Now it's actually really tough. So the game changes. All right, so all that's relevant. Our age bracket will reign supreme for our lifetime. Yeah, probably. What's the best way to learn how to use solvers? Consult YouTube and then hire a coach. Check out Michael Acevedo, the GTO expert. Let's see what everyone's saying here. Okay. All right, what else? Do I have anything else to say about this? Oh, pay attention, right? You need to pay attention. Whenever you're at the table, don't be talking on your phone, don't be playing on your phone, don't be watching a movie, don't be watching sports, don't be reading a book. Don't do all those things. And instead, pay attention to poker, right? So how do you pay attention to poker? Something I learned from Tommy Angelo a long time ago. He would um, keep a rubber band on his wrist and snap it every time he wasn't paying attention. I don't necessarily like that one. Another one I learned is if you have a stack of chips, take a small denomination chip and put it on top of one of the other stacks. I don't really like that one either because it um, could screw up your chips whenever you bet them. Because like, listen, whenever I, whenever I bet, believe it or not, I don't actually look at my stacks that often. Very often when I'm betting, I'm looking at the opponent, which is one of the real reasons that you don't want to have your chips in this silly stack. Because then you have to, oh, I what am I betting? Let me look at it. No, you need to be looking at your opponents when you're betting to see how they're reacting. This is common sense, I think, but maybe a lot of people don't do that. But if you have your chips stacked appropriately, you'll never screw up. So um, you don't have chips on top of the other one. So what I do is I try to take a little break every time I'm under the gun or under the gun plus one. Those are the seats you're going to play least often, right? Because you're supposed to play a tighter range there. So very often you can get up, I'm not going to say ignore the table, but walk around, take a little break. 
rest, stretch your eyes, look across the room. If you want to play on your phone, play on your phone during that hand. Give yourself a reward, essentially, or a break for playing well and paying attention well for the other seven or eight or nine hands, whatever it is. So keep all that in mind. All right, what else do we have? Do you have any other future plans with Dr. Cardner? You also want to have more tournament seat giveaways. Yeah, a lot of people like free money. Um, all, we have more of that in the future. Dr. Cardner is currently writing a new book, not with me, with her co-host. I think his name is Gareth. And I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be published through DMB Poker. Sabio says a commentator said how uh, the opponent will or a guy will go for an overbet bluff in a spot exactly when it happened. So listen, if the opponent is if the player that we're talking about is good, then yes, they're gonna make a big bet, a big bluff whenever they have a busted draw, but they're also gonna make the big bet when they have the nuts, right? If you're perfectly balanced, then your opponent can't do anything, you just win the pot, right? It's very, very powerful to have a strong polarized range on the river. Because if you have a polarized range and you're balanced, as you should be if you're using the strategy against good people, you will demolish your opponents. How will you demolish them? Well, no matter what they do, they break even or lose. So either, well, you just win the pot is what it amounts to. If you do some math, we discuss this over at PokerCoaching.com, um, you'll get, uh, you just win the pot. Whatever's in the pot. If the pot's a thousand chips or a thousand dollars and you bet any size on the river with a perfectly polarized range, you win whatever's in the pot and your opponent can't do anything about it. Um, that said, a lot of people are very unbalanced in those spots because they're not good at poker, right? If you're not good at poker, then if you're unbalanced, you're just going to be easy to beat, right? If I know you only overbet with the nuts, life is easy. <laughs> it's always easy when your opponents are just terrible, right? So, yes, if a commentator points out someone's terrible and they make a terrible play, that should be obvious. That said, in live poker especially, you may find spots where you just happen to have your 40% of bluffs, or your 20% of bluffs or whatever it is, and you happen to have that 10 hands in a row. And now some people may look at this and think, oh, this player only overbets his bluffs. Then they start calling every time, and then they really start to get crushed. Huh. I should make a book called The Little Things in Life. Ooh, that's a good one. I've been um, considering writing a more mainstream poker book. I don't know if it's exactly me about business, about finances, etc., etc. But The Little Things in Life is a solid title. I've been looking for a good title. So, Sabio, I think you are misunderstanding the fact that predictable is irrelevant. If I tell you, if I lay out my specific strategy on the river, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to overbet in this spot. I'm going to, actually, I'm just going to bet the pot. I'm going to bet the pot on the river with 67% nuts, 33% bluffs. I tell you this before I bet, and I'm honest. And then I bet pot. Then you lose. You lose the pot. You can't do anything about it. I'm perfectly predictable, and I'm telling you my exact strategy, and you still lose the pot. That is the power of strong game theory optimal strategies. Um, you can say, I'm going to be betting 1.5x pot or 2x pot, whatever the size you give. As long as you are balanced, your opponents will get crushed. So Sabio mentioning overbet bluffing at the final table. Maybe that was just um, because they ended up with the hands that should be overbet bluffing, right? You only saw 40 hands maybe that were being bet on the river, and that makes sense, right? Like I just said. Also, if you're the chip leader, if you're the uh, big stack, you should be putting your opponents all in. Keith said, you love poker coaching. Good. Glad to hear it. Which state do you think has the softest cash games in tournaments? A state where there is no legal poker and no games. Almost no games. Probably Alaska or somewhere like that. I bet Alaska has some sick poker games. I'm trying to think. Pure speculation, I would say Alaska. But yeah, pay attention. You really, really, really have to pay attention. Some people mention having things like ADD and whatnot. I mean, I have a hard time focusing sometimes. And that's why you need to come up with tips and tricks to keep yourself focused, to keep yourself paying attention. And you can do things like only have coffee when you're playing poker or only, I mean, stand up and stretch. Make sure you go to the gym. Make sure you're in good shape. Don't wear yourself out, but make sure you're in good shape and ready to pay attention. 
Yeah, John, I was going to say Texas, but I decided not to say Texas. You want to know why? Decided not to say Texas because Oklahoma's right next door. That's going to pull away some players. Also, I know they have a lot of private, quote-unquote, clubs there. And I think that does not lead to the best poker games because they take a lot out of rake. I am... The reason I picked Alaska is because I know a lot of people there have money. Some people there have money. Some people have oil money there, right? Also, a lot of fishermen are there who go away for six months or whatever. They come back. They're home for six months with nothing to do in Alaska where it's probably freezing so you can't go outside. So they play poker, right? So that's all relevant. And uh, Donk makes the point perfectly. Alaska dude, two five obliger last week said no or little poker is played there. Exactly. Exactly. That is why the games are good because there are no pros, right? Find your way into a game in Alaska. Just because this person say there's little to no poker doesn't mean they don't exist. And um, there you go. Softest games. Hard to get into. Hard to find a good one. But you'll clean up if you want to go there. So Sabio keeps thinking that predictable necessarily means bad. and predict Or predictable does not mean bad. Or, look, predictable is good if the strategy is game theory optimal, right? Like a tic-tac-toe, right? If I tell you my exact strategy at tic-tac-toe, you can't win. It's impossible. Why? Because tic-tac-toe is an easy game and it's solved. Poker on the river is very close to a solved game. So, on the river, when you're playing a solved game, Make the play that is unexploitable. And that's it. Game's easy. Is it possible to feel more comfortable in 2-3 instead of 1-2? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I try to not care about comfort. I think comfort's pretty irrelevant. Cyber says no one plays GTOs. It's hard to apply multi-way. First off, you weren't talking about a multi-way spot, right? You gotta, you're, you're jumping all over. Whenever you're presenting an argument, you have to be very concise. No one's talking about multi-way pots. You were talking about one specific player using overbets at a final table. And I gave you all the reasons why maybe that assessment's good, maybe the assessment's terrible. But in general, if people play a GTO strategy on the river, which is not hard to do, count your combinations. You have, say you know you have 18 combinations of nuts and nine combinations of bluffs, you bet pot. Everybody who's good knows this. And that's it, and you crush. Say you have more combinations. Say you have 18 and 18. 18 bluffs, 18 nuts. Well, you can't really go all in then because your, your opponent should call every time, right? So you have to give up with some bluffs. You want to give up with bluffs that block your that don't block your opponent's calling range. You want to be blocking your opponent's calling range when you're bluffing. Anyway, th this is like good fundamentally sound poker. It's not hard. So figure that out. Tim says Alabama. Alabama could be another good guess. Um, Alabama's a solid guess. You have to go somewhere where there's money, though. I'm not sure there's a lot of money in Alabama. It's a tough thing. Um, Dean Nelson says, if you're bankrolled for a game, you should feel comfortable. I mean, listen, my the idea of I need to feel comfortable to play a game is kind of silly to me because you're playing the same game all the time. And if you make the poor decision to play way too big, then you made that decision. We accept this. So here we go. If you're playing too big, then you shouldn't have played in the first place, Right. You see this happen at the end of the World Series of Poker main events. A lot of people, they're deathly afraid and super excited because they're playing for millions of dollars. Well, you shouldn't have played if you cared about this. I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people, but you should not be nervous or like losing your mind when you just happen to make it to the end of a tournament that you signed up for. I know a lot of people are, but they're doing it wrong. I think it was Dan Legrand who posted the, the other day about how like people a long time back, a long, long time ago, or 10 years ago, were really happy and celebrated back in the day whenever they won. And then players today, they just get up and shake hands and they go get dinner. And it's true. Why is that? It's because people today who are good realize your emotions will cause you to make significant mistakes. If everyone's emotions are going wild and you're making significant mistakes, then you all break even, it doesn't matter. But ideally, the person who's less excited has an edge. The person who cares about the money less has an edge. And... People of my generation have understood that winning money is nice. Winning the game is nice, but it doesn't like, define your life, right? Most players, I mean, whenever I won my first World Poker Tour, I don't, I wasn't excited. You can go back and watch it. There's a Jonathan Little Player of the Year video. Mike Sexton says, smile, son, you just won a million dollars. This was me whenever I had 
I don't know, 300, 400K to my name. I want a million dollars, 2X my bankroll, whatever it was, 3X my bankroll. And I didn't care that much. Why? Because it doesn't matter that much. A lot of people associate gambling games or money in general with an extreme amount of personal value. But it just doesn't matter that much. And you say, I was so serious. And I don't think, I'm not even that serious. I'm a pretty jovial guy. But like, why do I need to jump up and down to celebrate? I just don't need that in my life. And a lot of the good players don't need that in their lives. Ordinary man, how do you pick up quick reads? I already told you that. Pay attention. Um, if you spot someone opening lines up an offsuit in early position, it should be more likely to three bet or call. It depends. You're stuck playing in Los Angeles. No, good. Los Angeles games are great. Funny you say, when you don't care, you play better. That's great advice. I mean, this is a tough thing. Someone came to me the other day essentially saying, um, I typically only play for big money because that's when I care the most. That's when I focus the most, right? And... Sure, but at the same time, it's not a good strategy. It's not a good strategy to only play bigger and bigger and bigger because then you're not going to actually... Like, look, you're not always going to need to play big. And the problem is, is, say you normally play $100 games, but you really pay attention in $500 games, that's going to get old eventually. Biological conditioning is a real thing. And as you learn, $500 is the new normal. You're really not going to be able to focus in small games anymore, and then $500 is going to become normal. Now you got to play 1Ks or 2Ks or 5Ks or whatever to really be on. And that is not what you want in your life. <clears throat> GT Kid posts a humongous question. I'm not gonna give an answer to that today. Limping is fine though. It's harder to bluff at smaller stakes. Right, you should be value betting more. Run for the hills if Jonathan is celebrating. I mean, listen, I, I've, I've never been in this, I mean, I can I tell you a few situations I've been in where money has been quite significant, but I still didn't care. One time I was on the bubble of a $180,000 buy-in tournament. It was 100,000 pounds in London. Private tournament, it was nice. They added 100,000 pounds to the prize pool. It was fantastic. And um, I did it's on the bubble in a spot where I could have folded. But I didn't, right? This is a good example of a spot where obviously I, I would like to get in the money and get $380,000 or whatever it was. But we have the aces, so we're putting our money in. I would have gotten in with kings and queens and jacks and ace-king. And we were against jacks and fives, and we lost to the set, and we bubbled. And that's okay, right? If I somehow was at the final table of a major tournament, well, we've already done that, right? And played perfectly fine as standard. You may ask why I never offered a chop in my big tournaments. I've played heads up three times for $500,000 or more against uh, good players, but... I'm always pretty sure that I care about the money less than them, and I probably have more experience than most of them. Turns out, one of them I was playing against, Jonathan Jaffe, who was like the best heads-up player in the world at the time. So that probably was not wise, but he didn't present a deal, and I didn't present a deal. We probably both had it under our impression that we were both um, very good players. And luckily I won that one, so that was nice. And then the other two were against Scott Clements, who I knew was a good player, but I don't know how much heads-up experience he has, and I know I played a ton of heads-up online. So we'll play. Another one's against the guy, Corey Carroll. Good online player, but again, I don't know what, how much heads up experience he has. So we play, right? And I just know that like money is not my value. It's, it's not the thing that I associate my value in. A lot of people think if I win, I'm good, and if I lose, I'm bad. But they just don't matter, right? It just doesn't matter. And then it says, as long as you make 100K from a year, you don't care if you lose 500 in a session. Get out a calculator, everyone. What's 500 times 365? Comfort in stakes is a real thing. Of course it is, but it shouldn't be. If you're seriously affected by losing a couple buy-ins, you won't be able to play optimally. Yeah, obviously. What I'm saying is if you do that, if you play too big to the point that, well, if you play not properly bankrolled, yeah, you're going to make mistakes. That's obvious. Don't be a fish, right? So many people... Treat poker like a gambling game. And it can be as gambly of a game as you want it to be, or it can be as free money of a game as you want it to be. The problem with the free money aspect is it takes a long time to where it becomes free money. And a lot of people just don't want to put in the work. They want to gamble. 
We're not here to gamble. We're here to collect the free money. And that means you keep your 100 buy-in bankroll. You keep your, whatever, 300 buy-in sit-and-go bankroll. Your 500 big bets and limit here. Gosh, I don't know. 500 buy-ins for poker tournaments. It's what you need to do. Bruce Lee, go read jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll if you don't know proper bankroll management. I wrote an article there just for you. It's long. Don't be lazy. You have to do some work. A lot of people are lazy. You don't need to be lazy. Was I happy when I won my WPT? Um, no, back then I wasn't happy about anything. I was not a very happy person, and I did not care if I won or lost at poker, because I realized we're playing a lottery game here, right? The way I always view tournaments, and it's pretty much the same today, is we buy a new tournament, and we get X number of lottery tickets. Say it's a 100-person tournament. If I'm very good, maybe I get three lottery tickets or two lottery tickets. If I'm bad, I get half a lottery ticket. Maybe no lottery tickets if you're really bad. And sometimes they pull your card, sometimes they don't. Once you buy in, you show up, you play your best, and that is it. You don't really get to determine if you win once you are at the table because all the preparation you do ahead of time is what determines if you make the right decisions. And you are there simply going through the motions. Now, going through the motions is, it requires a lot of focus and, and you know good play, right? But if you're bad, you're just losing your money. You're giving it away. If you're good, you're getting money. And I realized, hey, my number got called. That's lucky. Why should I care about that, though? If I'm lucky, why should I be happy about getting lucky? So many people congratulate people when they get lucky. And I think that's ridiculous. But a lot of people disagree with me about that. I, I try to ask normal people, like, why, why do they congratulate people who went in a slot machine? Like, you don't need congratulations. Congratulations for being lucky? You did nothing. You literally did nothing besides make a bad decision. You made a bad decision and got rewarded. Good job. No, right? Uh, let's see. David says, another good title for a book. Don't be a fish. <laughs> yeah. We sell the deal. It's $2.99 for three years. Support at pokercoaching.com. What's your suggestion? Don't be lazy. Really, listen. You have to ask, do you care about bettering your life? A lot of people don't care about bettering their lives. A lot of people just want to be lazy and they want to have people give them stuff. No one's going to give you anything. I mean, maybe someone will give you something. I mean, I guess I'm here giving you something. Um, that said, most people aren't going to give you something. They're not going to help you out. And you have to get out there and work for yourselves. Fortunately, today, you can listen to podcasts by some of the most intelligent people in the world. You can study poker from some of the best poker players in the world. You can learn anything, right? I learned to get in shape by reading the internet. I learned to do all sorts of things. I learned to make this video, this, this is stream, whatever this thing's called, by studying, right, and learning. Now, why do I do this? Because I'm trying to better the lives of other people and better my life at the same time. Mark says, that seems like such a jaded way to view a poker tournament. Makes it easy to not care a whole lot, right? Makes it easy for you to play your best. I'm not, I'm not going in there thinking, oh man, if I win this, I can pay off all of my debt and buy a house. Like, no. Text says a lot of people today are entitled. Yeah, it's true. Very, very true. LV says, I think it's LV. It might be Ivy. We'll call you Man. Man says, whenever a player wins a big pot, you tell him, nice hand to build his confidence. Oh yeah, definitely be friendly. No one's saying anything wrong about that. Facing a bet, does every hand in your continuing range need to have the required equity? Not necessarily. Um, say your opponent's best flop and you float with a gut shot, right? Or gut shot and overcard. You don't have the right equity, but you have um, equity to pick up the pot with bluffs, right? So you don't necessarily need the right equity with your entire range. Do you stake students long term? Go to pokar.com. That is the backing company I'm involved with. They will stake you if you're good. You have to play well and get lucky to win a tournament. Yes. That is definitely true. What's the best info to learn slash memorize mastering small stakes no limit hold'em? Study it, read it, and apply it. And do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Learn why you make all the decisions. I mean, my goal is not to hold your hand throughout your entire poker career. My goal is to teach you to be good and learn how to learn yourself. So you don't need me, right? Do they stake Americans? No. Americans don't get staked for online poker. You final table and turn with 31k up top and listening to my 
by with. I'm not sure if that means by or with, but good. Glad to hear that. Um, for American poker staking, there are a few groups out there, but you have to be very good to get staking. You have to understand that if you're going to go to any sort of conglomerate or a good player for staking who has any staking knowledge, you essentially need to prove definitively that you are a winning player. Ooh, alarm's going off. I have to get ready for that Inner Circle webinar. Um, and most people who say, can you stake me? The answer is obviously no. I mean, even for poker, I know they want you to be a pretty solid winner at the small stakes before they will stake you. Why? Because if you can't beat the small stakes, you're not good, and you probably aren't going to be good because most likely you just lack discipline and you lack the focus and drive to succeed. Any plans on playing in Los Angeles anytime soon? No. Don't you need luck to win at a tournament? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? You get your lottery ticket, you're 3 out of 100. 3 out of 100 is not very much. In today's game, with all the re-entries and all that business, it's more like 1.5 tickets if you're good. So you get 1.5 tickets. Then you have to ask, is it worth my time to go do it? Depends on the buy-in, right? A lot of people care about things like guarantees and how, many, how much can I win? What's first place? But none of that matters. All that matters is what is your ROI and is it worth it for you to spend your time to go collect it? Oh, jaded poker talk today, huh? Real poker talk is what it really is. Real poker talk today. Tough life. Well, sorry, we have to get ready for the Inner Circle webinar where we have to give very, very accurate and good advice, right? Trying to prove yourself disciplined. Do the things you know you need to do. Don't be lazy. If you ever think in your mind, okay, I need to get up and go to the gym, and then you say to yourself, eh, I'm going to watch TV instead and have a cake. You're not going to make it. When you think, I need to go to the gym, get up and do it, right? I'm the opposite of a procrastinator, where if I know I need to do something, I do it immediately. I have a book due in two years. It's almost done. Why? Because I have some time to do it, and I don't like having things on my plate. Why is re-entry rebuy bad? You like it because it gives you another shot. Because it gives all the good players shots, and they'll take the shots more than the bad players will, which lowers everyone's ROI across the board. Well, it makes everyone's ROI... Does it make everyone's ROI closer even? No, it just lowers everyone's ROI across the board. We write a book about GTO poker. Yes, it's already written. That's by Michael Acevedo. I'm basically done editing it. It's called Modern Poker Theory. Brandon Adams says it's the best book that's ever been written about poker. It's going to be fun. How can you find out your ROI by the time you realize you'll probably be retired? Play more. Play online. Play lots of volume, right? Again, a lot of people are lazy. Is the Inner Circle webinar free? No, you have to be a member of the Inner Circle. Inner Circle webinars are very exclusive. These are for the people who actually care and want to get good at poker and are willing to invest a lot of time to do it. Uh, we have bi-weekly office hours where I answer their questions about topics, whatever they ask me to answer. So today's is how to deal with four betters, right? This is not a, a basic baby topic, like what's your preflop raising range? It's how do you deal with four betters when I'm three betting them a little bit too aggressively? What should I do to adjust for this? And the answer may not be so obvious. Um, next time we're gonna go really deep on optimal buy-in sizes for cash games, tournaments, etc. Not just, um, Buy-in for the maximum or buy-in for the minimum. It's not that easy. It's actually way more advanced than that. I discussed that the other day here, and we're going to go even deeper than that there. You can find that at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. Sabio suggested a three-bet less is um, maybe right. Probably not, though. People saying you rarely see a four-bet in cash. Again, th these are students who are playing relatively high stakes against good opponents. We're not talking about how to play tiny stakes against people who are bad, right? So a different topic for a different group of people, right? So anyway, you can find that at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. And if, you know, this, the topics are a little bit advanced for you, that's fine. Uh, this four betting one, for example, we're going to discuss how to play against good players who four bet and bad players who four bet and tight players who four bet, right? Or tight players who three bet you. So we're going to learn about all of these things. You can find... Oh, so what we do is every two weeks we present on a topic of their choice. And then also they can call in and ask me their questions live right? 
They call and ask me their questions live, whatever problems they are having. And if they can't be here live because they have to work or whatever, um, then they can send in their questions and I answer those questions for them. So it's like personalized private coaching, right? So do you want private coaching at a relatively low cost? Go to pokercoaching.com slash inner circle. But yes, we discuss whatever topics they want to discuss. Is it more for high stakes players? No, it's more for people who are trying to become big winners at poker. A lot of people don't want to be big winners at poker. They don't want to work. They don't want to study. They just want to be given a chart and say, here, go follow this chart. It's not what we're doing there. We are teaching people to think for themselves and to win. And we do that by answering their specific questions and also by having them call in and talk to me live in real time. Um, so that's going to be it for today. Like I said, I have the Inner Circle webinar in nine minutes now. I should probably rest my voice. Inner Circle webinars go for like five hours now. They used to go only two hours when we didn't have a whole lot of members. But now we have a lot of members. And um, they all get their 15 minutes to call in. So I answer all their questions and they learn tons. All right, have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice. Have fun. That's all I have to say. I'll see you all on Wednesday or in nine minutes.